Good afternoon. It's my pleasure, privilege, and honor to welcome to the Googleplex Radhanath Swami, a renowned Vedic scholar, Bhakti Yoga teacher, and an author. So I first came across Radhanath Swami in a Burning Man video. Believe it or not, he does get around. And in that video, he said a statement that has stuck with me for a very long time. And that statement was, everybody is looking for happiness. But to find your happiness, you don't need to change your externalities. All you need to do is to change your consciousness. And the second time I came across Radhanath Swami was at the Wanderlust Festival at Lake Tahoe. So I told you he does get around. And he was there with Moby and Ziggy Marley. And he was giving a talk on uh, environmentalism. And at that time, he gave me a copy of his book, The Journey Home, an autobiography of an American Swami. And it's an extraordinary story in this book of adventure, of love, and mysticism. And in this book, he talks about, I read with fascination, of how a young man called Richard Slavin uh, from the suburbs of Chicago, a little hippie, he did have long hair back then, shoulder length hair, believe me, left around on a trip around the world seeking something, something that is calling out to him. And he went on this trip through Europe and East, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, through Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and finally found himself meditating in a cave in the Indian Himalayas. And along the way, he lost all his possessions and his diaries at least five times, sometimes just washed away by the river Ganges. And yet, when you read this book, you'll be struck by how striking is his recall of minute details going back 20, 30 years. And through this journey that he documents in the book, and you can get a copy of the book at the back, Radhanath Swami discovered that, that the fundamental problems in life are really caused by what he calls the frailties of human nature, and that there is a path to happiness, and that there is a path to solving world problems that entails what he calls shifting your consciousness. And to talk about that more, please help me welcome to Googleplex once again, Radhanath Swami. Timidandasya Gyananjana Chalakaya Chakshurun Bilitam Jena Tasmoi Sri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Paschatyate Satharine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Brinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. It is my great pleasure and honor to be with all of you today. This company, Google, started in a small way not long ago and has come to a level where it practically influences in every aspect of life 
almost everyone on earth. I have observed this as I travel around. Even little swamis like me, when I come to speak somewhere, almost everyone says, I googled you before I came. <laughs> what to speak of buying things for the household or making investments. Um, such, such a great power of influence your company has on so many lives throughout the world. I'd like to begin by speaking something about networking from the perspective of nature. Just a few days ago, I took a walk with one of my very dear friends to a redwood forest. Have you been to Muir Woods? Every year I go with one of my dear friends while I'm in this area to the Muir Woods. Just to get away from everything in the beauty of nature. And there some of the largest and greatest trees in the entire planet have been standing for hundreds or even thousands of years old. And as you're walking along little pathways the bark of the trees is so thick, and there's so many such trees, hardly any sun comes down because it's blocked by all the leaves and branches. And footsteps are kind of absorbed in this thick bark. So it's a very mystical silence. And as we were walking, we came to one of the largest trees in the forest there was a group of Chinese tourists in a circle around a park ranger. And I happened to stand just behind the tourist to hear what he was saying. He was about to tell what he said, the underground secret of the redwood trees. Now, an American coming from the 1960s, I still have an inclination to hear underground secrets. <laughs> he asked a question. He began by telling how these trees in this forest have stood over hundreds or thousands of years through massive snowstorms, windstorms, and devastating earthquakes. And yet they keep growing bigger and higher and higher and higher. Now for most trees to have strength, they need roots that go very, very deep. But the redwood trees, their roots do not grow very deep. And they're in an area with very loose soil. And it's a hilly region. How do they withstand these storms and earthquakes and keep growing? And then he paused for about a minute so that we could all ponder this question. How do they survive? And as I was pondering, I was thinking of all the storms that come in life, individually, collectively, socially, nationally, internationally. Then he revealed the secret. The roots of the redwood tree, they grow outward underground, reaching for the roots of other redwood trees. And as soon as they come in contact with each other, they intertwine and make permanent bond between them. They're interlocked. This means that one tree is locked in its root system with another tree on one side, 
and on another side with other trees. And the trees that are on the other sides of the trees that they're interlocked with are interlocked with other trees. And the little baby trees, their little tiny roots, these big ancient giants wrap their roots around them. In this way, practically every tree in the forest is connected. Their unity is their strength. Even through storms, winds, and earthquakes, they hold each other up and keep growing and growing and growing. This is nature's lesson of networking. United we stand, divided we fall. In our lives, our heart is like where our roots are. <laughs> and when the roots of our care, our concern, our affection actually connect with each other, we can develop such incredible strength. Even when the storms come, the storm of temptation, the storm of fear, the storm of reversals and challenges, we can hold each other strong. And this is very much a spiritual principle. There's a very beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita when I first heard this, I thought, this is what I've always been looking for. You see, I was born in a Jewish family near Chicago. And in my life, I had a natural inclination towards spirituality. But I saw so much hate and division in the name of a loving God. This was extremely disturbing to me. Either I have to reject the whole concept altogether, or is there something deeper? Something that actually is there in an essence that unites us and awakens real character and real love, something common. I believed in that essence, and I was seeking that essence. This is written about in this little book I wrote. I hitchhiked from London through Europe, through the Middle East, traveled through India, studying various religions under various masters, trying to find that essence. And a particular verse in the Bhagavad Gita, when I heard it, I was thinking, yes, this is what the world needs. And this is what I need. Would you like to hear that verse? In Sanskrit, vidyavanaya sampane brahmani gabihastini suni chaiva swapake cha pandita samadarshana. Real wisdom. It is defined not by how much data we collect within our brains. Real wisdom is not how many degrees we have. Real wisdom is not how many followers we have. It is to the extent we have the capacity to see every living being with equal vision. Whether one is man or woman, black, white, red, yellow, or brown. Whether one is from the east or the west. Whether one is a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or a Hindu or a Jain or a Buddhist or a Zoroastrian or a Sikh or, or an agnostic or an atheist. Whether one 
the Gita goes so far to say, whether one is a human or an elephant or a cow or a dog or a cat, wherever there is life, it is sacred. Life is sacred. When we understand how our own life is sacred, we will understand that sacredness and respect it wherever we experience life. In every tree, in every plant, in every living being. And then the Gita goes on to explain what is the nature of life? Najayate mriyate vakadachet nayam That the conscious force that seeing through the eyes and hearing through the ears and tasting through the tongue, touching through the flesh, thinking through the brain, loving through the heart, that living force is divine. It is satchit ananda, eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. It's indestructible. The body is constantly changing. The mind is constantly changing. The witness of these changes is constant. And that witness is our true self. Nahanyate hanyamane saride. That means it cannot be cut into pieces by any weapon. It can't be moistened by water. It cannot be burnt by fire. And it does not die with the body. According to the Gita, the body is like a car or motor vehicle. Some drive Mercedes, BMW, some drive Fords, some drive Volvos, some drive Hondas or Toyotas, and some drive Hindustani ambassadors. According to how much money we have and according to the choices we make, we get a particular type of car. The Gita explains similarly, according to the choices we make and according to what we've invested in, in what is called karma, where every action there is an equal reaction, we get a particular type of body. And there are so many different varieties of bodies. And there are so many differences differences in the ways religions describe things, their languages, their rituals, differences in habits and cultures, in ways of life, in physical appearances. But to understand the unity within diversity is the secret of actually finding peace and being an instrument of peace within this world. That atma, or that living force, that soul, is the true self. And at the time of death, according to the Gita, when this car of the body is no longer suitable to us, we go into another car according to the choices and the desires we have created in this life. Human life is very special because we have such a vast capacity of free will. You'll never see a cow jumping on rabbits and devouring them. And you'll never see a tiger grazing on grass. Because they are programmed. You people are the best computer people on the planet, so you'll <laughs> understand it better than me. Because they're programmed with a particular consciousness. But a human being has such free will. We could be saints. We could be serial killers. 
We could be envious. We could be everyone's well-wisher. We could be respectful and self-controlled, or we could be completely wild and impolite. But with that power of free choice comes responsibility. The Bible says, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. In the Vedic text, this is called the laws of karma. For every action is an equal corresponding reaction. But the soul, the atma, is beyond all these things. But when the atma, due to the ahankar, or the false ego, identifies with this temporary body and this mind, instead of understanding, I am in my body, when we think, I am this body. I am observing life through this mind. I am this mind. There's a big difference. If we identify with it and forget our true nature, then we're deeply affected by every situation that comes to us. Yoga means to reconnect. And interestingly, the Latin word religio, which is the root of religion, means to bind back. They really mean the same thing. They don't mean just to be a particular sectarian group that feels that I have knowledge and nobody else does. Religion actually means to reconnect with our own essential self and with the grace of God and to be an instrument of that grace in whatever we do. And when we make that connection with ourself to understand our own eternal, pure, loving nature, then we can actually see it in everyone, in a dormant state. And then even nature, our environment, our ecology, when we're in harmony with ourself, we'll be in harmony with nature, we'll be in harmony with each other. I write about this in the book. In 1971, I got a very wonderful lesson from an event that we may see every few days something like this, but we don't really take it seriously. The Bible says, seek and ye shall find. If we're really seeking wisdom, it's amazing where we'll find it. We'll find it everywhere. I was sitting on the bank of the river Ganges. It was the summer, very hot, probably 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and nobody else was there at the time. It was actually at Prayag, the place where the Kumbh Mela takes place. But it wasn't, I was just at Kumbh Mela, and the day I bathed in the same spot, according to the government, 35 million bathe, people bathed 35 million humans bathed in that place on that day. But in 1971, when I was sitting there, I was the only one around. A hawk was flying overhead. This hawk was hovering lower and lower and lower till he was just a few meters above me. I looked up at him. He had brown, white, and kind of gold feathers with his wings expanded and extremely sharp claws. And its beak was curved down and pointed very sharp. And yellow eyes that seemed to be unblinkingly gazing at me as he was coming lower and lower and lower. 
So naturally, I was thinking, maybe he's hungry. <laughs> and maybe I'm his food. Suddenly, he dove right into the water and went underwater a little. And there was a skirmish. And about 30 seconds later, he emerged from the water with a flapping fish in its claws. That fish was about a foot long. And it was really bewildered. It was just a few yards in front of me. And I looked into the eyes of that fish. He was, com he or she, I, don't, I couldn't tell. <laughs> and I don't want to call him it, so I'll just call him he just for conventional purposes. That fish looked so disoriented and bewildered. And I was thinking, he was probably just going about his day like every other day, swimming upstream, swimming downstream, maybe with family, friends, looking for food, playing did not expect that at the least expected moment it would be ripped out of its complacency by the hawk of destiny. And I was thinking how many people I know, how many people I hear about very much like that fish is just going about their days and all of a sudden they're diagnosed with a terminal disease. Or they're betrayed by a loved one. Or they get in an accident. Or there's an earthquake that devastates everything around them. It happens every day. No one expects it. That hawk of destiny is kind of flying over everyone's head and could come down to get us. And I was thinking how we shouldn't be complacent. We should make priorities in our life of what really is sacred, what really is important. I remember Martin Luther King speaking. He said, if you do not have an ideal you're willing to die for, you have nothing meaningful to live for. Do we have that ideal? Moments pass and we're just so preoccupied with superficialities. How much time do we really invest in trying to discover what's really meaningful and important in life. And then I reflected how if that fish was swimming deeper, the hawk could not reach it. And similarly, if our fulfillment, if our pleasure and meaning in life is deep, then whatever happens in this ever-changing world cannot really disturb what we have achieved within ourselves and cannot alter the integrity and the character in which we live. This is a beautiful building. But how many of us are thinking how wonderful the foundation is? The foundation, like the roots of those redwood trees, cannot be seen. It's something deeper than what the eyes can perceive. But yet, the integrity of the building is completely dependent on the strength of the foundation. The Bible tells like this. Build your house on solid rock. 
then any storm that comes will not, it may disturb it, <laughs> but it's just a temporary disturbance. But if you build your house on shifting sand, then when the storm comes, everything crumbles. How much are we really taking seriously developing the foundation of our lives? A deep inner fulfillment. In 1971, I lived with Mother Teresa for some time. And I remember she said something to me that was quite profound. And it was the same thing I was hearing from so many great sages in the Himalayas that the greatest problem in this world is hunger. Not hunger of the stomach, hunger of the heart. What is the, what is the one thing that nourishes the heart? Love. It's the most essential need for all of us to love and to be loved. If we have everything else but not that, there will be no fulfillment to the heart. And if we have that, whether we have everything else or nothing else, there's an inner fulfillment. Because fulfillment is not something that just the, the, the ever fleeting experiences that come before our eyes or that we touch with our skin. Those things are fleeting. Or even fame and prestige, they come and go in the mind. Fulfillment is a thing of the heart to love and to be loved. And the origin. The universal principle of all these great spiritual paths is that the origin of that love is within us. It is our inherent nature. In the theistic paths, it is to experience the infinite love of God, who has many names, who has appeared in this world in many times, in many forms, to feel that love and to love. And the Bhagavad Purana tells that when we experience that love and we, and we reciprocate with that love, it's like watering the root of a tree. When there is love of God, it naturally extends to every living being. Just as watering the root of a tree that water extends to every leaf, every flower, every branch, every twig. Doesn't discriminate. It's natural. According to the yoga principles, it is that, that spiritual experience that is the deepest fulfillment. And when we find that deep fulfillment within ourselves, then the ever-changing world and all the challenges that come cannot disturb it. The hawk of faith cannot go deep if the fish is swimming in a safe place. But if our happiness and our purpose and our meaning in life is based on all these ever-changing superficial conditions, at any moment, it could be changed. Ralph Waldo Emerson, he said, the reason why our society lacks unity and lies broken and in heaps is because man has lost connection with himself. 
or herself. This is a transcendental universal principle. To actually connect to that essence of who we really are. If a person has chronic boils, boils are extremely painful, and you have to let them go through their natural course. I've had many in my life. We have to treat the symptoms. We put salve on it. We treat that boil in a particular way. But if the cause of the boils is a disease in the blood, unless we treat that, then there will just be continuous. We treat one, we make it better, and another comes. Some years ago, I was sitting in the New Delhi airport. I had just taken a pilgrimage of several thousand people for about two weeks in a place called Brindavan. And I was really tired. And I was waiting for a flight to get back to where I live in Mumbai. And I was really happy to kind of just be alone waiting for the flight. And then somebody came up to me and said, the union minister of the government of India for the environment wants to speak to you. So I said, OK. <laughs> And she came up, and she challenged me. She said, what are you swamis and yogis doing for the environment? The rivers are polluted. The oceans are polluted. The ground is polluted. The air is polluted. And you're just sitting around chanting your mantras and meditating and doing your pujas, your rituals. What are you doing? We need action. So that was a challenge. It's kind of like a storm. It's like an earthquake, actually. <laughs> Very powerful lady. Um, and she stared at me, waiting for an answer. Because she really cared. She really cared about the environment. And I remember responding by using the same example. When we're covered with boils, we do have to treat the symptomatic problem. But if the cause is a disease in the blood, we have to treat that. What is the cause for all this crime and all this hatred and hypocrisy in the name of religion? What is the problem with the greed on Wall Street that's actually creating such a destabilization in our own economy? What is the problem in India among politicians who for, for bribes are willing to compromise and let the people suffer? And what is actually the reason why there's all this pollution? It's a pollution within the human heart. When our heart is polluted, we're going to, through our words and through our actions and through the decisions we make, we're going to pollute the world. Because what's in is expressed through what we do and say. We have to address, we have to educate people how to live in harmony with ourselves how to live in harmony with each other, how to live in harmony with God, and how to live in harmony with nature. And today's world now, it has come to a point with all of our incredible science and our incredible technology and the, the unbelievable development of industry and the armies and the weapons and the bombs and the incredible power of communication. If we don't use these things with the right attitude, with the right motives, 
we have the power to really cause serious destruction. The purpose of religion, the purpose of spirituality, the purpose of yoga is very simple. It's not a sectarian idea, it's to clean the pollution in our hearts. Transformation. Transformation of arrogance into humility. Transformation of greed, toxic greed that can never be satisfied. Being a millionaire, being a billionaire cannot satisfy the heart. That's the way greed is. It's like a fire. The more you feed it, the hotter it burns. And selfishness. Transforming selfishness into a desire to selflessly or unselfishly serve others. Hate into love. Envy into being, into rejoicing over somebody else's good fortune. And actually connecting. Connecting to a grace, an energy that is within all of us and everything that brings out that love that is within us. So I told this lady that we're trying to do our part. <laughs> and you're doing your part. And we should work together. Because if, if we don't clean up the internal state of human consciousness, even if you clean every river, every ocean, all the air and all the ground, as long as that selfish, egoistic greed is there, they're just going to pollute it all over again. And she smiled and said, yes, we must work together. This is the potential of those interlocking roots of the redwood forest. <laughs> we all have our differences. Some of us are accountants. Some of us are software engineers. Some of us are managers. Some of us are politicians, farmers. Scientists, technologists, in a human body, every part of the body has a unique function. But they're not fighting with each other. It's not that the brain says to the kidneys, I'm better than you. You do what I say. And it's not the liver tells the heart that you can't do what I can do. And the heart doesn't tell the eyes, you are low class. <laughs> Every part of the body has its own color, its own shape, its own function, but they all work together for the sake of the whole body. And only when that's there is there health. When we can see beneath the external, superficial differences that we all have with each other, and we actually understand the essence of who we really are beneath as divine, eternal, all-loving beings, then we can recognize how we're all connected and how every one of us, we could respect each other for what we contribute, like the parts of the body. I may not be able to do what you can do, you could probably do what I do. <laughs> Just recently, I spoke at the HSBC Bank headquarters in London. And there was 900 bankers. And I was supposed to speak to them. That was the event. And I, was, I actually looked out at them and started laughing. <laughs> Even now, I'm laughing, just thinking about it. And I had to just be honest. 
I said, I don't know why you asked me to speak to you. <laughs> you're one of the greatest banks in the whole world, and you're among the greatest bankers in the whole world. There were all these department heads and CEOs and everything there. And I said, and you're asking me to speak to you? I have not had a bank account and have not signed a check since 1969. They looked at me <laughs> like I was an alien <laughs> from a distant universe. Like, how do you survive? Now, I can't say to all of you that I have never looked at Google, because everyone has to look at Google. <laughs> Even people without bank accounts. Are <laughs> but you see, whatever our strengths and weaknesses may be, cultured humanity is when we honor and respect what a person can contribute. Instead of judging people according to what I have and what you don't have, what I can do and what you can't do, where I'm from and where you're not from, what religion I'm from and what you're not from. Real love manifests as compassion. Real love manifests as having compassion with equal vision. Of course we have to discriminate, but not in an egoistic way. It's not that you go up to a tiger and embrace it because we are one. That's foolishness. Well, for most of us it would be. We keep a distance. I was speaking last night. I lived in the Himalayan jungles with one yogi and he taught me that the leopards and the snakes and the panthers, they're all around you. You're sleeping under trees in the jungle. And whether you're awake or asleep, they have greater power than you. If you feel that you are better than them, or if you have any fear of them, they will kill you. But if you see the sacredness of life and honor and respect that, don't go and start petting the cobras. Give them their space, and they'll give you your space. And believe it or not, it really works. But you know what I found? That it's much more difficult to do that with humans. Because <laughs> humans have really complicated egos. <laughs> Animals are predictable. <laughs> But that is our potential. And that is how we could actually make a real difference within this world, in whatever we're doing. I am um, just so happy, so grateful I have this opportunity to be with all of you. And to share what I have learned from my beloved Guru Srila Prabhupada and from all my experiences in life. Thank you very much. Do you differentiate between dogma and spirituality? and where do you draw the line? And the second question is, you talk about us being greedy, having negative energy, um, and the question I have is, 
any thoughts on why were we created that way to begin with? Why be created ill and then be commanded to be well? Can you say that last question why, why were we created ill and then were commanded to be well? <laughs> Thank you. There could be many definitions of dogma. But essentially, whatever religious or spiritual rituals or beliefs we have are really meant to be an aid to transform our hearts. Just like, for example, you want to send a letter to someone. Of course, these days, this is not a very relevant example. In the old days, when I grew up, we used to have envelopes. <laughs> and we'd put the address in the envelope, and we'd put the stamp on the envelope, and then we'd send it. Nobody cares about the envelope. They want to see what's the content of what's inside the envelope. So our aspirations, our goodness, our will to be purified, our will to love God, our will to, to be an instrument of God's grace in this world, that's what, that's what all the religious, that's what meditation is for. That's what ritual is for. It's a form in which we can communicate. When we identify our religion with the envelope and we don't really concern ourselves with the content of what is our character, what are we asking for, what are we offering, what are we giving? In spiritual life, the envelope of whatever external forms may be there, it's for the purpose of giving love and receiving love. But if the content in our heart is envy or ego, arrogance, and that's what we're using the envelope of our religious rituals for, that's not religion at all. Then it becomes a very empty, misused form of dogma. That's one way to explain that. As far as the second question, we are not created ill. The Atma, the living force within us, is perfect. It is a part of God. As we said, it is eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss beyond death, beyond birth. But we have free will within this world. And according to the choices we make, it not only creates a reaction, but it also creates an internal inclination toward doing the same thing again. A crude example. Most of us are not born with a unbearable craving to smoke cigarettes. You make the choice. It's not that people shove cigarettes in your mouth. Of course, people could be all around you smoking and you're inhaling it. But you make a choice at a certain time to, to smoke the cigarette. And as far as I have heard, the first couple cigarettes people smoke, usually they don't like it at all. They're like <coughs> But it's kind of cool to do it. You know, the, the movie stars do it, and, and the, my idols do it, so I'm going to do it. And as you make that choice, the inclination to smoke another one becomes more and more and more. So we become habituated by the choices we make. Similarly, when we do good for others, doing good for others is addicting. When, we're, when we criticize other people, every time we choose to criticize someone, 
we become more habituated to respond to a situation through criticism. This is the laws of karma. Whatever choices we make, not only does it create reactions as far as what comes to us in this world, but it creates inclinations within us. So the, so the greed and the arrogance and the envy and even the cruelties of this world, as well as the goodness and the compassion and the forgiveness, these inclinations we have are very much due to how we have programmed ourselves, by how we have chosen to act in the past. And the present moment is how we're programming the way we experience and see the world for the future. What is going to be our inclinations? You see, you can't change what we've done in the past. But whatever comes as a reaction, we have the free will how we're going to respond. If something negative comes and we choose to respond in a positive way, then we are creating positive karma. And not only that, but we will have a greater inclination there's a Native American Indian example, which I think very suitably addresses this question, that there are two dogs within each of us. There's a good dog and there's a bad dog. The good dog represents our divine nature, forgiveness, humility, kindness, responsible self-control, decency in how we do our business with... I know some of the wealthiest people. They earn their money with integrity and they spend it with compassion. And they're as competitive as anybody could be and successful as anybody can be, but they built it on this foundation of love. You see, this bad dog, envy and anger and hatred and vengeance and greed and selfishness, and then the good dog is there which is our good character. And they're both trying to demand our attention. I think we all have that experience. And for some people, that bad dog really barks loud. And the good dog... Which dog is going to control us? Which dog is going to bark the loudest within us? It's the one we choose to feed. Real culture, real humanity is to learn the art in every situation, even if it's challenging, to feed the good dog within us and neglect the bad dog. We are inherently good. We are inherently godly. To reorient, reorient ourselves to our true nature, it's the greatest need for fulfillment within our own lives, and it's the greatest need within the world. Within our tradition, we chant these mantras, or the beautiful sweet names of God. And the purpose of that is simply like a mirror. When you look in a mirror, you're supposed to see yourself, but when it's covered with dust, you see dust. When we clean the mirror of the heart through these beautiful spiritual practices, then we see the beauty of the love of our true nature and we could reflect that love in whatever
we do. I'm so grateful. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you.